So thank you all so much for coming to my presentation tonight. My name is Stephanie Law, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering here at the University of Delaware. Tonight, I'm going to tell you what material science and engineering is, why it's important, and how researchers in the MSEG department at UD are creating new materials one atom at a time. So when we think about human history, we frequently discuss progress in terms of the types of materials used for tools and buildings. One of the earliest periods in human history is the Stone Age. In this time period, tools and structures are made from naturally occurring stone. Although stone is ubiquitous, it is difficult to shape and cannot easily be molded into rounded shapes. After the Stone Age comes the Bronze Age. The use of bronze was a major improvement over the use of stone. Bronze can easily be cast into a variety of shapes and is relatively stiff, making it ideal for tools, weapons, and armor. The next major age is the Iron Age. Iron is much more abundant than the tin and copper used in bronze. Although iron had been known for centuries, it was not as widely used as bronze due to the difficulty in working iron. Metal workers in the Iron Age learned to improve iron through a variety of physical and chemical processes, making a material that was stronger, lighter, and harder than bronze, while also being easier to source. Iron was widely used in agriculture and construction. The next material to become important in human history was glass. Glass has existed for millennia, but mass production of glass became widespread only in the 13th century. Glass is, as we know, transparent to light, it's chemically inert, it can withstand high temperatures, and it can be recycled endlessly, making it an important material for a wide range of applications. Finally, we come to modern materials like steel. Steel is primarily composed of iron, with small amounts of carbon and other elements added to control its properties. Just like glass, steel has been known for thousands of years, but in the 19th century, mass production finally became possible. The use of steel has revolutionized our society, enabling the construction of skyscrapers and railroads, the fabrication of inexpensive tools like cutlery and fasteners, and a variety of medical and other devices. If you look around you, I'm sure you will see multiple objects made from steel. Last, we have silicon. Silicon is the foundation for almost all modern computers and cell phones, as well as many rooftop solar panels. The use of ultra high purity silicon for computer chips has revolutionized basically all aspects of our daily lives. Now, the materials I have discussed are clearly not an exhaustive list of all the materials that have played an important role in the development of human society. Among others, I have left out aluminum, paper, and plastics. However, even from this incomplete list, it is clear that improvements in materials have been foundational to humanity's progress. So the materials that I have just described are all naturally occurring materials or alloys. Over time, humanity has refined these materials, but they all occur in nature. However, if we look at the periodic table, we can see that there are a huge variety of elements available to us that could be combined in a wide range of ways. In particular, we can imagine making materials or material structures that combine elements or molecules in ways that are not found in nature, thereby engineering designer materials with unique properties. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you how we can create designer materials one atom at a time. In my lab, we use a technique called molecular beam epitaxy, or MBE to grow thin films of new materials atom by atom. In this technique, we deposit one layer of atoms, then the next layer of atoms, then the next layer of atoms, and so on, to build an entire film. You can think of this as atomic scale 3D printing. In 3D printing, you're building your structure up one layer at a time. In MBE, we're doing the exact same thing, except our layers are atomic scale. Since we're building the film one layer at a time, we can stack different layers of materials together while precisely controlling the thickness and composition of each layer. In this way, we can create designer materials one atomic layer at a time. So in the figure on the right, you can see a transmission electron microscopy image of a film grown by MBE. In this case, it's a bismuth selenide film grown on a gallium arsenide substrate. Each layer of atoms is clearly visible and you can see the sharp interface between the bismuth selenide layer and the gallium arsenide layer. So how does MBE actually work? 
So in a moment, I'll tell you about each component in detail. But first, let me just give you an overview of the system. What we do is we evaporate materials from effusion cells. These atoms move in molecular beams toward the substrate. The pressure of the MBE is so low that the atoms don't run into anything on their way to the substrate. The substrate is hot, so the atoms can diffuse around on the surface. The atoms then bond to one another and to the substrate, forming one layer of atoms. The new layer has a crystalline or epitaxial relationship with the substrate, hence the term molecular beam epitaxy. So we have multiple MBE systems at the University of Delaware, and they're housed in the Materials Growth Facility. This is a staff-supported user facility located in DuPont Hall. This photo shows one of our two MBE systems. The system is made up of a load lock chamber, which is where we load bare substrates before growth and unload our samples after growth. After loading, the substrates then move into the buffer chamber before being placed into the growth chamber for deposition. We also have an electronics rack that houses all the power supplies for the machine, as well as a computer to control the film growth. So now let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. When we first put a substrate in the chamber, the load lock is the first stop for the substrate. The substrate is placed in a holder, which then rests on one of the shelves in the load lock. After the substrate is placed in the load lock, the air is pumped out and the substrates in the load lock are heated to 200 degrees Celsius, which is about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. This step is crucial as it removes any contamination on the substrate, such as water vapor or dust. The substrate is baked at 200 C overnight to ensure that it is as clean as possible. You can think of the load lock in the same way that you think of the airlock on a space station. We don't want to put the substrate directly into the main chamber since that would expose the growth chamber to water vapor and other contaminants in the air. Instead, we put the substrate into the load lock first and remove all the contamination through heating. After the substrate is sufficiently clean, we open this valve here and move the substrate from the load lock into the buffer chamber. The buffer chamber stays under vacuum all the time, so it's extremely clean. This is again a close up of the buffer chamber with multiple substrates in it. After the buffer chamber, one substrate at a time is moved into the growth chamber. The growth chamber, like the buffer chamber, is under vacuum. The pressure in the growth chamber is routinely as low as 10 to the minus 10 torr. So for comparison, pressure here in Delaware at sea level is around 760 torr. And pressure at satellite altitude is only 10 to the minus 9 torr. So the pressure in our MBE is actually one tenth the air pressure at satellite altitude, or one trillionth of room pressure. This is extremely important because we're depositing our films one layer of atoms at a time. If we had any air in the growth chamber, the oxygen or the water vapor molecules might incorporate into our film, and this would ruin the crystal. At the pressure in the MBE, an atom can actually travel over 100 kilometers before it would hit another atom. So we work very, very hard to keep a low pressure in the growth chamber so that our films are as atomically perfect as possible. One way that we keep a low pressure is by having many, many vacuum pumps. In this case, the growth chamber has two pumps, one shown here and one shown in the middle panel. The buffer chamber has one pump and the load lock has two more pumps shown in the right panel. These pumps are on constantly and are constantly removing air and other contamination from all three chambers. If you ever come by and visit us in the materials growth facility, you will notice that it's kind of noisy. That's primarily caused by the pumps that are running all the time. The other way we keep the growth chamber clean is by baking it. As I said before, we try to never open the growth chamber to air as it'll contaminate the chamber. So we use the load lock and the buffer chambers to load and remove samples without ever opening the growth chamber to air. Unfortunately, sometimes something breaks in the growth chamber. Then we have to open it to fix the broken part. When we do this, water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen, and other gases get into the chamber. Our vacuum pumps can of course remove these contaminants, but the process is slow. So to speed it up, we actually construct this gray tent around the MBE. This tent is made of insulating blankets, and inside the blankets, we put a heater. 
This heats up the entire area inside the blankets to between 100 to 200 C, which is about 200 to 400 Fahrenheit. It's about as hot as your oven at home. Heating the MBE this way makes the water vapor and other gases evaporate off the walls of the growth chamber so that they can be pumped out more quickly. Every time we open the chamber, it takes about one to two weeks of baking to restore the vacuum that we need. This is why we try to open the growth chamber as rarely as possible. All right, so we can now talk about how we actually grow the films. So we start with ultra high purity elemental source material. For example, we might buy pieces of silicon or pieces of bismuth that are 99.999995% pure. We then put these pieces of silicon, for example, into a ceramic crucible. This crucible goes into an effusion cell, which has a heater. We heat up the material and it evaporates. The evaporated atoms move toward the substrate as a molecular beam. Again, because the vacuum in the growth chamber is so low, the atoms don't run into any other atoms on their way to the substrate. The atoms then combine with atoms from other sources on the substrate to form one new layer of atoms. So this might sound complicated, but it is actually the exact same principle as your toaster. Your toaster uses a heater filament to heat up your bread, which causes water to evaporate from the bread, resulting in toast. Our effusion cells, use a heater to heat our source material, causing atoms to evaporate. The main difference is that our effusion cells cost tens of thousands of dollars, unlike your toaster. So here are actually some photographs of the effusion cells. The effusion cells attached to the growth chamber, as shown in the red circle. Each MBE can house up to 10 effusion cells, enabling, in principle, the growth of a film with 10 different elements in it. So in this photograph, you can see three effusion cells, as well as two blank spots. When we pull the effusion cell out of the MBE, it looks like the photograph on the left. Here you can see the power couplings and the temperature readouts, and here you can see them again. So this is the part that's inside the MBE system. In this top-down view, you can actually see this white ring here. That's the crucible that's going to hold the source material. And here's a picture of the crucible when it's actually pulled out of the effusion cell. So you can see in this particular effusion cell, the crucible is rather small. We have other effusion cells that hold a substantially larger amount of material. And then if we pull the crucible out of the effusion cell, in the picture shown on the right, you can see the heater filament here. Right? This is what's going to heat up our crucible to allow the material to evaporate. Each effusion cell has a shutter in front of it to control its deposition. As soon as we heat up the effusion cell, it starts evaporating material. So we use the shutters to control whether or not a particular material is being deposited on a substrate at any specific time. The shutters allow us to grow layered structures with sharp interfaces between the layers. We use a computer program to control the shutter opening and closing times. So the duration of the shutter open time plus the effusion cell temperature determines how much material is deposited. Finally, we can monitor the film quality while it is being grown using a technique called reflection high energy electron diffraction, or REED. So REED uses a high energy beam of electrons generated in the electron gun, shown in the center picture, to diffract off the crystalline film. These electrons then impinge upon a phosphorescent screen, shown in the picture on the right. The electrons form an image and by monitoring this image, we can determine if the film is crystalline or amorphous, whether it is atomically smooth or has a rough surface, what the spacing between the atoms in our film is, and how quickly the film is growing. So we have a camera and software to help us interpret the read data. So it might seem from this discussion that MBE is a technique that's just used by some niche research labs. However, MBE is actually an industrially relevant technique and MBE-grown structures can be mass-produced. So some of the things that are made by MBE include lasers, like the one in the iPhone 10 face ID, light-emitting diodes, especially blue and ultraviolet colors, transistors, primarily used for the power chips in your cell phones, infrared camera chips, like those that go in night vision goggles, focal plane arrays that are currently used in self-driving cars, and high-efficiency solar cells that are used on spacecraft. 
So now I'm going to give you a few examples of the type of research that we are using MBE for here at UD. First, one of the major research thrusts is creating layered structures. So as I described before, one of the major advantages of MBE is that you can stack different types of materials together to create a new material with entirely different properties. So on the left, you can see a scanning electron microscopy image of a layered material grown by MBE. So the dark layers are a reflective material and the light layers are a transparent material. So we're stacking up reflective, transparent, reflective, transparent, reflective, transparent. So the question then becomes, well, is this composite material going to be reflective or is it going to be transparent? And it turns out that this composite material is reflective when light is shined in one direction, but transparent when light is shined in the other direction. And then you can imagine when light is shined on an angle, the material acts in really bizarre ways. We can make light bend backwards, we can slow light down, and we can squeeze light into extremely tiny volumes. These are called hyperbolic metamaterials, and they have a wide range of applications, including extremely sensitive environmental monitoring, imaging below the diffraction limit of light, and on-chip light routing. On the right now, you can see a transmission electron microscopy image of a bismuth selenide film grown on a gallium arsenide substrate. In the cartoon, you can see, um, you can see a cartoon of where the atoms should be located. Each bright spot in this TEM image is one atom. So again, MBE lets us stack different types of materials together. And in this case, we're investigating these material stacks for improving the optical infrastructure for terahertz light as part of the new MERSEC Charm Center at UD. In addition to growing layered materials, MBE can also be used to grow nanoparticles. So on the left, you can see an STEM image of a terbium erbium arsenide nanoparticle embedded in an indium gallium arsenide film. Um, oops, wrong way. In the yellow circle, I've highlighted the terbium erbium arsenide nanoparticle. So these nanoparticles actually self-assemble during the growth of the film. It's actually more energetically favorable for the terbium, erbium, and arsenic atoms to form a nanoparticle that's embedded within the matrix than to just scatter randomly throughout the film. Embedding self-assembled nanoparticles within a film can radically change the properties of that film. The new composite material can have very different heat transport properties, it can be used to improve terahertz light detectors, and it can be used in solar cells. Finally, MBE can be used to grow self-assembled nanoparticles for quantum computing. The quantum computers are predicted to solve some types of problems faster than traditional computers, and quantum encryption is unbreakable. However, in order to make a quantum computer, we need to create qubits, which are the quantum analog of the classical bits that are in our traditional computer. MBE can be used to create self-assembled nanoparticles like the one you see in the scanning electron microscopy image on the left. These tiny nanoparticles can actually be used as qubits. In this case, the picture is showing nanoparticles of bismuth selenide that self-assembled on the surface of a piece of gallium arsenide. Unlike the nanoparticles on the previous slide, these nanoparticles are not embedded within a film, but are formed on the surface of the film. On the right, you can see data taken from another type of qubit grown by MBE based on indium arsenide. These types of novel qubit materials may one day form the basis of a quantum computer. These are just a few examples of the power of using MBE to create new materials one atom at a time. So with my remaining few minutes, I would like to highlight some other ways of making new materials that are happening in the MSEG department at UD. So some of my colleagues work on polymer-based materials. The idea is similar to MBE in the sense that they are creating new materials by starting with very tiny building blocks. However, in this case, they're actually starting from small molecular building blocks shown in the upper left panel. When these small molecules are combined together, they can form longer chains called polymers as shown in the middle panel. In this case, the small molecules are exposed to each other and self-assemble into these chains, similar to how the atoms in MBE self-assemble into thin films. By controlling the reaction parameters, the properties of the polymer can be controlled. These long chains can then be deposited on a substrate to make polymer films. Alternatively, 
One can start with biomass waste products like lignin from paper waste or fatty acids from used cooking oil. You can then extract small molecules from these waste products and react these small molecules together to form new usable polymers. Polymers are the basis of the plastics that you use in your everyday life. So by combining these small molecules in ways not found in nature, researchers can create biodegradable plastics or new types of plastic materials with engineered properties. Finally, some researchers at UD are working with peptides to create a an entirely new type of structure called bundlemers. So peptides are short chains of amino acids that are found in nature and are used in biological processes. However, bundlemers are created when the peptides are joined together in new ways not found in nature. By controlling which peptides are used and how the different peptides are attached to each other, the properties of the resulting bundlemer can be controlled. Bundlemers are yet another example of using natural structures, in this case, peptides, and combining them in ways not found in nature to make new engineered materials with designer properties. Overall, research in the MSEG department at UD is focused on creating new materials and new material structures, one atom or molecule at a time. As I've described, these materials have a huge range of applications, including solar energy, drug delivery, optics, quantum information, biomaterials, and so on. Finally, I would just like to thank all of the students in my research group. So this is a photograph of my graduate students and postdocs. They're doing all of the work and took a lot of the pictures that I showed today. I would also really like to thank Dr. Christopher Shuck, shown here. He is the engineer that keeps the materials growth facility up and running, he maintains the MBEs, and he's generally a huge help. Finally, if you would like more information, you can contact the College of Engineering, Material Science and Engineering program. We just launched a new undergraduate major. So if you're an undergrad at UD or a prospective student who's interested in joining MSEG, please contact us. We also have information about the MSEG graduate program, the UD Materials Growth Facility, and I'm always happy to take questions by email.